These first from a nursery rhyme, passed down orally from generation to generation, describes the story of a city and the sea. What allowed this place, once a frontier settlement far away from the heart of China, to ultimately become a major hub of global maritime commerce? This seaport, which is located in neither the Yellow River nor the Yangtze River Valley, achieved astonishing levels of prosperity between the 10th and 14th century, unequaled anywhere else around the world. Turning it into a legend of the East, who set in motion the events that allowed such prosperity to persist for 400 years, and who is responsible for preserving and passing down that history throughout the past millennia of history? Normally, it takes only eight minutes for the elderly women of Chaonan Village to walk across this cross-sea stone bridge that was built at the end of the Northern Song Dynasty. If the bridge was not there, the women's journey home would take ten times as long. Just like the elderly women, the people of the Song and Yuan dynasties had great need for quick access across waterways. To address this problem. We built hundreds of massive stone bridges, setting off a bridge-building boom that would last 300 years, right through the era of greatest commercial prosperity. To this day, Anping Bridge in southwest Chengdu retains the title of the world's longest flat-beam cross-sea stone bridge. However, what really astonishes researchers is that when you line up the directions indicated by each of these bridges, what you get is a massive land and water transportation network. This network ran along the docks in the harbor, through city and town markets, and the mountain area north of the city, reaching deep into the central plains territory. Through these Songyuan mining pits, as well as a five-meter-thick layer of iron slag, the Shaozhaopu Iron Production Site of Qingyang Village in Anxi demonstrates a massive ironware production base. Additionally, there were also kiln sites capable of firing huge batches of ceramic wires dotted all over Chengdu and the surrounding area. These batch production assembly lines, without exception, were all within close proximity to a main road used for transportation. This is a highly integrated territorial structure that combined production, transportation, and marketing. Was this brilliant orchestration of a such large territory something that happened organically, or was it planned out intentionally? In the city, Tim Ho Temple welcomed the devout pilgrims every day. Outside the city, each time fishing folk went out to sea, they offered sacrifices to their sea gods. According to scholars, sea god temple used to be places for maritime merchants to gather and exchange information. Revering the sea gods was a way for the people to regulate industry, and it ensured the commercial regulations were respected and upheld. The world's gentleman of trust, engraved on the Zhengwu Emperor's pedestal, signified an official government position awarded by the government to those who successfully solicited foreign merchants. During the Songyuan period, Zhengyu Mountain. Was a designated site for government officials to conduct religious ceremonies to pray for fair weather before sailors set out to sea. 
successful maritime trade. The imperial court's promotion of folk religion helped demand the wheel of the state. All of these well-preserved relics serve as proof of how the state advances maritime trade and commerce. However, what truly marked the rise of Quanzhou as the empire's premier port for overseas trade was the Quanzhou Maritime Trade Office, whose site has recently excavated. The government office that used to stand on this stone and brick paving was a custom house for the Song and Yuan empires. Not only did this office generate wealth, it also helped the nation, whose civilization was founded in agriculture, to expand its mastery of commercial principles. Through this open portal, participants in maritime trade across Eurasia shared the fruits of commercial and cultural exchange. A Fujian boot ship from the Southern Song Dynasty was discovered at the bottom of the South China Sea. This discovery opened the floodgates for Chinese underwater archaeology. More than 180,000 artifacts were recovered from the shipwreck, including myriad exotically styled Dilhua porcelain wares, ironworks, and Arabic golden ornaments all showing clear characteristics of being export products. This fully laden ship from Quanzhou offers valuable information about not only China, but also the world beyond China. Long before the shipwreck, it's the South China Sea was ever discovered. The wreckage of another Fujian boot ship was unearthed from the seals of Quanzhou's Hozhou port. This southern Song ship was carrying a full load of imported spice, including ambergris, frankincense, and pepper, on its way back to the harbor. Why did this ship something sink so close to the shore? What happened back then is still a mystery. Two cargo vessels of similar make heading in two different directions, carrying completely different cargo. The implication is that they were part of the same import-export commerce chain. According to the travels of Marco Polo, for every commercial vessel laden with pepper sailing towards the port of Alexandria in Egypt, there were 100 times as many heading to Quanzhou. In most overseas travel logs recovered from the Song Yuan period, the most exclusive price is almost always reserved for Quanzhou. Located on the longest shipping line in medieval times, Quanzhou was unrivaled in terms of the volume of trade conducted. This has attracted the curiosity of scholars, as a world-class market such as Quanzhou would inevitably produce two types of people, world-class consumers and world-class merchants. So, who were they? Red Jones Two Man Street is not large as far as neighborhoods go, but its atmosphere and scenery can't be found anywhere else in the world. The millennium old Guan Yue Temple is right next to the equally ancient Qingjing Mosque, the oldest standing mosque in China. Across from Qingjing Mosque is the even more ancient Confucius Temple, flanked by even older Buddhist and Taoist temples. What is fascinating is that a large group of imperial clansmen once settled in this area. The Southern Clan Office was their administrative agency. In the Southern Zone shipwreck, archaeologists discovered these wooden tags bearing the names of the owners of various goods. Among them is this tag with the character for Southern House written on it referring to a member of the imperial clan of that time. However, the words on many tags show ownership by people from different social classes in Quanzhou. At that time, 
This was a global society where people of different ethnic backgrounds and religions lived in harmony. The people within this community came not only from Qingzhou and the hinterlands of the empire, but also from Eurasia and many other foreign ports. Together, they built Qingzhou's diverse commercially oriented social structure. They were both consumers as well as participants in maritime trade. During that era, in which almost everyone was involved in commerce, even monks in temples, out of their commitment to improving the welfare of the people, were actively involved in bridge and road construction and river dredging to build ports, and some even participated directly in foreign trade activities. On the 26th day of the lunar calendar, Kai Yuan Temple stages its monthly ceremony of veneration of the Buddha. As usual on such occasions, West Street outside the temple is filled with incense, becoming a bazaar for street vendors. As imported stone material is unloaded from the ship by crane at Shuhu Port, the Chinese freighter named Zidan is preparing to head out to sea. Ancient docks leave behind memories of days past. The stone pagodas along the shoreline still serve as navigation markers guiding mariners home. Back then, long-distance global maritime trade connected the diverse societies and cultures of the world, making cross-cultural prosperity a reality. Today, as the heart of the eastern terminal of the sea route, Trinjo's maritime voyages continue unabated. The fascinating city of Quanzhou remains committed to advancing global maritime trade through inclusivity and accessibility. The exchange of civilizations that began along the ancient maritime Silk Road continues in this new era.